revival that's, that swept up the Wesley brothers and others in the 1730s was a great transatlantic revival. And I, and I don't think we should ever forget that this revival made a massive impact on the church of the day and is still going today, thank God. The revival, however, took place within the Church of England. And, and the question of whether or not the church needed the revival is a question that, that really is, is, is something that it's worth asking. And I think the answer is yes, it needed a revival, but the question is to what extent? The Church of England, we have to remember, was the church that produced people like John and Charles Wesley, the same church that produced George Whitfield and Samuel Walker and Howell Harris and John Fletcher and so many of the other greats that we know of from, this, from the history of Methodism. But the question is, in what ways did the church that produced these amazing evangelists actually need the work that they were a part of? Now that's a question I think that is, that is rich for the historian and is something of interest today. It's, all, it's of interest in part because we've created a false narrative and I do want to correct that before I go too far along here. The false narrative is that the Methodists arrived and somehow saved the Church of England. Um, it's a false narrative in that, like I said, the Church of England was the bedrock and basis upon which these evangelists actually uh, performed their ministry. To say that John Wesley, for instance, as just one of the uh, great evangelists of the period, uh, came out of a vacuum is, is simply wrong. Um, the Wesleys were shaped by the liturgy of the Church of England. They were shaped by the narrative of the Church of England, its homilies, its rhythms, its history. And in so many ways, they actually brought forth a new presentation of that Anglican um, or English Christianity in fresh and new ways. Now, at the same time, the church in the 18th century wasn't perfect, just like the church today. And so there were aspects of the Methodist revival that I would argue, um, even, if, even acknowledging that the Church of England was a solid church in the 18th century, there were ways in which it could improve. Now, some of this had to do with, with the context of the 18th century. With the 18th century, I think we have to remember a couple of things. One, the church was um, finally entering a period of peace after the, the wars of the 17th century. Uh, the, the history of the English church after the Reformation is a back and forth and back and forth between Catholic and Protestant, high church, low church, Puritan, Anglican, uh, and, and by the 18th century, finally, there's some semblance of what the Anglican via media might actually look like. And so there was finally this sense of peace. But in the process of finding that peace, um, a number of groups, some of them the most passionate members of the Church of England, had been ejected from her membership. And this is something to keep in mind when we think about the, the revival that took place with the Methodists. The first group I want to highlight is the Puritans. And normally we don't think of the Puritans when we're thinking about the most passionate members of the church. We think of these dour people who, uh, for most Americans think of these dour people in Massachusetts um, who, who wore gray or black and never smiled and uh, banned Christmas because they didn't want anyone to be happy. Well, first of all, that's a caricature. It's not a really good example of Puritanism. But also, the thing to remember about Puritanism is that it was a movement to purify the church that put a great emphasis on personal spiritual development and devotion. Some of the greatest devotional works that, has, that have ever been produced in the English language were written by the Puritans. You think of people like John Bunyan. Um, you think of, of authors like Daniel Defoe. In fact, anyone who has visited Samuel, uh, it's not Samuel, but um, Susanna Wesley's grave has been amongst uh, many of the great Puritans of the period because many of them are buried very near to her in that dissenting burial ground across from Wesley's Chapel in London. But in 1662, with the Act of Uniformity that was, that was passed by Parliament when, when Parliament two years earlier had asked Charles II to, to, to come to the throne, they had ended the Commonwealth period when, when England had no king, um, when they passed the Act of Uniformity, a part of that act was that people would follow the Book of Common Prayer. This required people to, to accede to a number of theological categories, some of which the Puritans were not 
not happy with, including the idea that somehow regeneration was a part of the, of, of the baptismal service. Over a few thousand ministers, including both of John and Charles Wesley's grandfathers, were ejected from the church for not accepting that. So keep that in mind. Another group that left later when, during the Glorious Revolution, were the, um, were the non-jurors. And without going into all the history of the non-jurors, it was a group of about two or three hundred um, spiritually minded intellectuals in the church. I think that's the best way to summarize it quickly. And they were ejected. I'll give you an example of, of the type of people in this group. Thomas Ken was a part of this group. He wrote the doxology. So many of you have sung his words, maybe not knowing that they were written by Thomas Ken. So, both of these passionate, spiritually grounded, uh, intense forms of English Christianity had been expelled from the Church of England by the 18th century. And so what do you have? You have a vacuum created within the church that, that really, um, the evangelical revival, with its emphasis on the new birth, this idea that God can recreate you uh, from head to toe uh, in such a radical way that we have to call it a new birth entirely, um, that really filled a void in the Church of England and in English Christianity. And that, I think, is what the, the Methodist revival brought back to English Christianity was this emphasis that God wanted to transform you as an experiential faith, but it was also a faith with deep intellectual rigor. Um, we can't forget that, that the Wesleys were highly educated um, and that John Wesley, in fact, was a professor at Oxford. Um, the, the other thing it filled a void with was this idea of a spiritual devotional life and that was a part of the Methodist revival too. There are other ways to look at it, but I think in a seven minute segment, the idea that, that Methodism filled a vacuum that had been left through it from the 17th century uh, and brought that forth in the 18th in a new and powerful way, I think is a wonderful way to look at it.